How are we to treat those who are different from us? Welcome to Pastor's Point, I'm Dr. Jamie Schmitz. Today's program addresses this question. This Pastor Dusty Pawkin from Plymouth Church of the Nazarene in Plymouth, Michigan, shares his message entitled, Unity is Not Uniformity. What is your happiest elementary school playground memory? Is it playing kickball on a sunny day? Is it climbing to the top of a splintery jungle gym and looking out across the vast creation? Is it impressing your friends with how far you can kick your shoes off of the swings? Well, whatever your happiest memory is, it is really unlikely that you were on that playground by yourself. You were probably there with lots of other kids, maybe some older, some younger, classmates and best friends, but you were all on the playground at the same time. Maybe things are different now, but when I was in elementary school, most of the kids actually played together. I remember going to a birthday party at a broken down trailer park one time, and then another birthday party at a multi-million dollar mansion. Now the parents might have been whispering judgments to one another, but as kids, we were just in it for the Nerf Wars and pizza party with our friends. And that was my entire elementary school experience. And then you go to the big school at junior high. You're a little older and you need to impress the huge, scary eighth graders with your starter stash. And most importantly, you need to choose a clan. Now, I know we were all friends just a few months ago at fifth grade graduation, but now, are you a jock, a nerd, a stoner, a band geek, a mathlete, or whatever new categories we have now? YouTuber, I guess. Your clothes, your slang, your music, uh, the hangout location within the school, your hobbies, your grades, all reflect the clan that you've chosen to affiliate with. People like us do things like this. I'm part of this clan, and surely I wouldn't associate with those other clans. Well, that's human nature, but that's not necessarily good for our souls. Let's take a look at James chapter 2 today. James writes this, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes, and you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor person, well, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well. Doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guarded by evil motives? Can you see the problem here? This is God's people who love him. They love people and they want to serve their community, but they're being terribly divided even at church. And they're mistreating people that are made in the image of God. There is pressure from the world to treat one type of person differently than another. And in this case, they save nice seats for the people that can afford fancy clothes, and they let folks with the dirty clothes sit on the floor. The King James has a hilarious translation of this. It says, sit here under my footstool. I imagine a guy in a nice fancy chair with a big ottoman, and then another guy that so desperately wants to be in the presence of God, he's willing to sit underneath the footstool of the other guy. Have you ever experienced a class system like this? Well, if you've ever flown on an airplane, you have. The comfortable, spacious seats up front are for those that can afford first-class tickets. The privilege to choose your seat and load your carry-on sooner comes with a price. And after all the diamond clubs and preferred plus members and frequent flyers, then the dregs who bought their regular old tickets get to board, if there's space for peasants like us. Now, I get it. Space on a plane is limited, and that's the business model. But let's make sure that we never allow that to happen in our churches. It was a real problem in the first century and beyond. Here's what James continues on. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those that love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones that slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? God's kingdom is an upside-down one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. 
Those who are rich in this world get lots of perks, but they may miss out on what matters most and lose their own soul. Again, when we hear the word rich, we think of a billionaire with a personal spaceship. But if you're watching this program today, you're probably rich by global standards. You very likely woke up in a temperature controlled environment this morning. You got to choose from a variety of food. You had plenty left over. Uh, you might even have your own personal transportation vehicle and you might even have a special home for that vehicle called a garage. Maybe sometime this week you will hire someone to cook, serve, uh, and then even clean up food after you at a restaurant. That is rich, my friend. Let's not abuse it. Now, division in churches isn't only over rich and poor like it was in James' day. It could be young versus old, uh, newcomers versus long-timers, suits versus t-shirts, hymns versus worship songs, King James versus NIV, liturgical versus casual, and it goes on and on and on. I love a quote regarding these divisions. In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, charity. A divided church breaks God's heart. And it broke Paul's heart, too. Here's what he wrote to the Galatians in chapter 3. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, according to the promise and heir. Jesus didn't just die for the Jews, the churched. He didn't just die for the Gentiles, the unchurched. But Jesus died for everyone. Not only did he tear down the barrier between God and man, he tore down the barrier between different races, classes, and genders. We are each made in God's image and have intrinsic value because of that. We love and value people not for what they can do for us, but because they bear the image of God and are loved by him, and then therefore they're loved by us. But James is writing to a group of followers of Jesus who are not loving their neighbors as themselves. And as people often do, they're looking for a loophole on why that's okay. They were hoping that by keeping part of God's law, they were earning enough favor to ignore the other part, like the loving your neighbor part. But it doesn't work that way. James continues, Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing sin and are guilty of breaking the law. For the person that keeps all laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's law. For the same God who said, you must not commit adultery, also said, you must not murder. For if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you've still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. The next verse here is absolutely critical to the Christian life, but I'm not sure that it gets the amount of attention that it deserves. He says this in verse 13, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Do you see the correlation here? There is no mercy for you from God if you've shown no mercy to others. Uh, if you watch Cobra Kai on Netflix like I did, you know what a life of no mercy leads to. But if you have shown mercy, God will be merciful when he judges you. Jesus put it as plainly as it gets in Matthew 7 too. He says the same way you judge others, you will be judged. The same measure you use, it will be measured out to you. So how much judgment do you want in your life? How much grace do you want in your life? Well, I have good news and bad news. You get to choose. Are you offering a teaspoon of grace to people and expecting a five-gallon drum in return? You won't get it. Have you turned on and weaponized a power washer of judgment and are only expecting a drop of judgment in return? Jesus says the same measure, the same amount that you use, will be measured back to you. Do you want a little thimble of grace when you mess up? 
If that's what you give, that's what you'll get back. Could you use a little more grace? Maybe a coffee mug's worth of grace in your life. Then give more. If you're like me, you need a garbage can full of grace. So I need to keep dishing out buckets of grace to other people when they make mistakes. You see this little thimble of grace? It might not show up on the, on the camera. This is giving somebody one chance to get things right. And then you explode in anger when they get something wrong. How about a coffee mug full of grace? This might be forgiving somebody that hurt you without asking them for forgiveness or them even being remorseful. But what about that garbage can full of grace? That might be praying for and serving your enemy. Someone that has actively caused you harm. Maybe you buy them lunch. Maybe you cut their grass. Maybe you give them a gift. Not in a passive aggressive way, but in a Jesus washing their feet type of way. Jesus knew Judas would betray him, but he didn't skip washing his dirty feet at the Last Supper. He made room for him at the table. He saved food and drink for him. That's giving a bucket of grace, Jesus style. All right, buckle up. James is gearing up to make this really practical. This book, maybe more than any other New Testament book, spells out the Christian life in an insanely raw and real way. There's no beautiful poetry here. There's no mysterious imagery or confusing prophecy. Just brass tacks, tell it like it is, discipleship. James continues in verse 14. What good is it, my dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions. Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Ouch! But that's exactly what I love about this book. For some reason, Christians love to argue which Bible translation is best, which method of communion or baptism is the right one, uh, end times theology, hymns versus worship songs, and any of number of other things. They like to argue with other Christians. All of those arguments are on things that don't really matter, and they can be distractions from things that really do matter helping people experience the soul-restoring grace of Jesus. So James is saying, look, I hear you talking a big game about your faith, but if your actions aren't backing it up, you missed it. This was a big problem in the first century when James wrote the book. And thankfully, we've solved that since then. No, I guess not. So this is like someone that constantly posts memes and hashtags for a cause, but doesn't actually do anything to support that cause. They want to be part of the movement, but they don't actually make an effort to serve the needs or meet the people of the tragedy that they're hashtagging. That's words without deeds. As humans, we are a crafty bunch. We love loopholes, especially in our faith. Listen to these two well-crafted arguments that uh, these two groups make in James' writing. He says, now some may argue, well, some people have faith and others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe and tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that the faith without good deeds is useless? So there are two groups here, each lacking wholeness in their relationship with God, but they're trying to create a loophole. One says... These works are evidence of my faith. See, I obviously know God by all these good works that I'm doing. The other group says, well, my relationship with God is internal and personal. I don't need to do any good works because my faith is strong. It's just me, Jesus, and the Bible. James says they're both incomplete. Faith and works partner together. And then he even gives some examples. Verse 21. 
Don't you remember our ancestor Abraham, who was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. So it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we're shown to be right by God by what we do, not just faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so faith is dead without good works. So it's easy to fall into one of those two ditches. Uh, the first is trying to claim that your personal relationship with Jesus internally is enough without any tangible, practical good deeds. This is over-spiritualizing our relationship with Jesus and missing the practical ways of actually loving our neighbor and serving our community. Should you be praying for the kids at your church? Absolutely, but maybe also serve in the nursery once a month. Should you include, include the teens in your work, weekly prayer list at home? Of course, but maybe go to an event and support and encourage them. Now the other ditch is the doing trap. These are the type of Christians that are always running task to task, event to event, proving that they love God by their activity. They show up early, they get things done, they stay late. There's an unlimited amount of things that can be done at church and in the community. But if we're not careful, we can actually miss Jesus in the midst of our doing. It happened to Martha as she was preparing a dinner party that Jesus himself was at. How do you miss Jesus when he's right in your living room? By running around, doing the dishes, sweeping the floors, and getting the finest cups off the top shelf. So what's the balance then? Is it possible to even get it right? How can we avoid the errors of the solely internal or the solely external expressions of faith? Well, I believe the answer is serving from a place of rest. We intentionally slow down to be with Jesus, to hear his word, to walk in his ways, and to serve out of a deep relationship with him. Not out of guilt, not out of shame, not out of duty, but out of love for him. This creates a living, loving, vibrant relationship. We can't rest if we're not taking time to slow down and be in the presence of God. Now, you, you may need to cut some activities out of your schedule. And we won't serve if we're constantly caught up in our own internal struggles and issues. But serving takes the focus off of ourselves and it puts it into a productive activity to serve someone else and help them to know God. Rest in quality time with God and then serve others out of that place of rest. I brought this challenge to our leaders earlier this year and I'd like to extend it to you watching today. It's super simple. Share a meal with one person that you've never eaten with before by the end of this calendar year. Now, hosting a meal in your home is best, but I know that can be a challenge for some. So take somebody to lunch, coffee, or dinner. But it has to be somebody you've never shared a meal with. This is not the time to invite your best friend or a fringe family member you haven't seen in a while. It's time to connect with a person outside of your normal circle and that you want to extend God's love to. Maybe they're significantly older or younger than you. Maybe you grew up with very different backgrounds or cultures than this person. Maybe you had a conflict many years ago and you forgot why you're still mad at each other. Don't let those be hurdles to showing God's love to this person. You eat with those that you love. So that's my challenge for you. Share a meal with somebody that you love that's outside of your normal circle. It is a practical way to be Jesus to someone. Invite them into your home, take them out somewhere. When you're there and you pray for the meal, not only pray for the meal, but bless that person in your prayer. Give thanks to God for that person. Be thankful how God, for how God is working in their life. Don't do all the talking. Listen to their stories. 
Ask good questions. Be interested in their life. Pray with them for in the following days and weeks after you've served them. Jesus did some of his best ministry around the table with food. And that's a method I don't think we need to update. So I'd like to take a few minutes to pray. And as we're preparing for prayer, think about the person that the Lord is laying on your heart. Who is somebody outside of your weekly routine, outside of your schedule, that God is saying, I want you to show them the love of Jesus by simply opening your home and preparing a meal for them. Now, it doesn't make for compelling TV, but silence is a critical part of the Christian discipline. So, if you're at home, uh, wherever you're at, can I invite you to just close your eyes, push out the distractions, and let's just be silent before the Lord for a few seconds, and then we'll pray. Jesus, thank you that we can meet in your presence today. Thank you for your goodness, for your grace, and your mercy. Thank you that we can choose the amount of grace or judgment in our life by how much we give away. Help us to be the type of disciples that are treating people like you treated people. Help us to be the type of disciples that are opening our homes in love, that are making space for people, even making spaces for the Judases in our life. It's so difficult. We cannot do that on our own. We need your Holy Spirit to fill and empower us, not just to love people that are like us, but to love our enemies. That's the type of Jesus followers we want to be. Lord, I pray right now that you would send us a name of a person that you want us to extend your love and grace to with just a simple meal, somebody we've never eaten with, that we want to show what, that there's space in the kingdom for them. We pray that you would open their heart, that you would speak to them, that you would bring your word, that you would speak through Christian music and books and circumstances and all of the ways that you work in somebody's life. Thank you that you're calling them long before we even get to meet with them. Lord, we trust you to do far beyond what we could ever do. We just make ourselves available. We want to be your word, your presence in our communities, in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces. Use regular, everyday people like us to build the kingdom. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Pastor's Point. I trust this message has been a blessing to you and hope you consider connecting with this local church. To learn more about Pastors Point, visit wlmb.com forward slash Pastors Point, where you can send us feedback, watch episodes on YouTube, and find a schedule of pastors for this season's episodes. Pastors Point is a local viewer supported ministry that couldn't exist without the generous support of viewers like you. If this message has impacted you, please consider making a financial gift today and make sure to send us a note about how Pastors Point has made a difference in your life. Thank you for supporting us and helping us bring a variety of life-giving messages right into people's homes through the ministry of Pastor's Point.